Well, I'm really glad that Noah sent out the, the call to have this discussion today. It really makes me feel um, a little, you know, a little less alone, a little more like our normal days where we get to be in conversation with each other. So thanks everybody for getting on this uh, Zoom to try to bring our collective um, experience and wisdom to the moment that we're in right now, um, thinking about religious leadership in the time of, of COVID. Um, I uh, have with us here, so I'm Bree, let's go to the Executive Director of the Center for Religion and Civic Culture at USC. We have Aziza Hassan, who's the Executive Director of New Ground, a Muslim Jewish Partnership for Change. Uh, Reverend Dr. Najuma Smith Pollard, who is at the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement and also the pastor of Word of Encouragement Community Church. And Rabbi Noah Farkas, who's at Valley Beth Shalom. And the nice part about today's conversation is it's a conversation amongst the friends who meet and interact and work really regularly. So I, I feel grateful for that. How are you all doing today? Counting my blessings, just trying to hold the gratitude. Yeah, similar, doing well. Um, you know, it's a good, it's a good day so far. <laughs> yeah, every day is just, uh, it's it count each day individually. And um, with the spring holiday of Passover coming, I've been, Passover more than any other holiday is uh, designed for those who are obsessive compulsive amongst us. And um, so compulsively cleaning at the same time as, uh, which is therapeutic. Um, and in addition to getting ready for the holiday. So we've got a lot of holidays that are kind of coming up right now. Um, it's a moment of uh, real deep religious engagement and reflection, uh, important uh, marks in the calendar for uh, many religious traditions. Noah, maybe we could start with you about what, what are you reflecting on related to what the spring holidays, what Pesach means uh, in this moment of plague? Yeah, so Passover is a, I mean, it's, it's like one of our core holidays. It, it celebrates the exodus from Egypt, which occupies the Jewish mindset in the middle of the Bible for pretty much every single generation since it happened. Um, and, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts about this. It's almost like Passover is exactly the right holiday to be celebrating in this moment. For thousands of years, Jews gather in homes to celebrate Passover. You don't go to synagogue. The center, the center of the Passover story is not in the synagogue. It's in the home around the table with uh, what's called the Seder, which is our table worship, which is a combination of storytelling and, um, and learning and eating, obviously. Um, there are more sacred foods associated with Passover than any other holiday. So, um, so that distributive sense of religion feels right in this space. And, and I think like that's the first thing I was really thinking about. And then secondarily, like, is the challenge because it's when everyone comes together. It's when you're supposed to have 20 people in your home and your crazy aunt and your snoring uncle and your annoying grandmother and your loving grandfather and your, all your cousins, right? And in this time, especially, it's very challenging. It's extremely challenging. Um, because we can't be together physically. And so I've been trying to work with my congregation on how to overcome some of those challenges. And then just one other on the spiritual level, this idea of plague is at the center of the Passover story and plagues in the Passover story are weapons. They're weapons used by God to overcome tyranny of Pharaoh. And I can't help but reflecting on the, on the ninth plague, which is darkness. The, it's a special kind of darkness that falls upon Egypt in, in the story where um, it's so dark that a neighbor and a friend can't see each other. That's literally what it says in the Bible, that it's that dark. And that's what it feels like, I think, for a lot of our families, is that you can't see each other. You can't physically be together. For our um, oldest members, who are also the least facile when it comes to the internet and this technology piece, it's a double plague. They can't be together and they feel like they don't have the opportunity or understanding of how to connect. And so overcoming those challenges also feels like this is the right moment to focus on. And that's the dark part of Passover, but, but the Passover doesn't end in darkness, of course, it ends in the light. And, and that's the core message is that and, that, and that's the message that I think religious communities have used from the Exodus story 
across the world and across over time that that what begins in darkness ends in light what begins in a sense of deep sorrow ends in incredible joy and that is a religious message i think is right for today that's why i think passover is really the right holiday to be celebrating in this moment beautiful the jimma the the themes of darkness and light and death and resurrection run very much through holy week um and through uh easter how are you how are you grappling with those themes of religious holiday and celebration well, we do, we're, right now we're doing through our church, uh, we've been doing a Lenten devotional every morning at 6 a.m. or around 6 a.m. <laughs> and um, I was actually really excited to get to Holy Week, um, which began Sunday with Palm Sunday and really connecting the messages of each day of Holy Week to a very real and present danger, for lack of a better term, because when we look at Holy Week in the Bible, that was a time of great danger for Jesus and for his disciples. And typically Holy Week and even Resurrection Sunday takes on a very, um, a very um, light and soft kind of um, uh, ex experience because for the most part, we don't live in dangerous times. I mean, there's always something, but we don't, but, but, but today, right now it's a dangerous time. And, and so being able to relate the message of Holy Week to everyone being in real and present danger you know like it's serious um and you don't have that always with easter so sometimes easter holy week can become just rote behavior and much to what Noah was saying i think now it has a deeper meaning a deeper connection um and 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 so many people are praying uh, so many prayer calls are happening people are really like praying for healing praying for you know, the, the savior to come and bring them out. And so it's just a deeper, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's actually more enjoyable for me now to, to share messages around Holy Week uh, because people are really seeking it, you know? And I, I mean, because we do it on Facebook, I've had people that I've never met before really express um, just how much they appreciate the devotional because they really need something to ground them in this, in this season. Yeah, I have found myself um, with a listening to a lot of Facebook reflections that uh, religious leaders have been offering, especially the sort of shorter nuggets that just kind of provide a sense of um, centeredness for the days um, across a lot of religious traditions. Aziza, um, Ramadan is coming up. It's a, a little further out than uh, Passover, which starts this week and Easter this weekend. So you have a few more weeks to prepare. How are you thinking about this holiday? So it's, I feel like I'm living in this place of radical contradictions where both we are connected more than we ever were before. I have access to um, services across different faith lines and my own in different faith, like different mosques. Um, and I'm also like, it's like, I feel so far away from everybody at the same time. And so to me, it actually takes me back into um, this, this, what in Islam we call niya, which is intention and setting intention. And so as we're kind of walking into that space and preparing for Ramadan, it's like, what's the intention of this month? And what does it actually mean to really prepare for this in such a beautiful way? Because my favorite parts of Ramadan are where we get to eat together, similar to these staters, right? Where we're like eating and it's, there's like robust food in every meal or every um, different type of food on the table has meaning and a story and a connection. Um, and then we pray together and it's so deeply powerful. And as we're kind of walking into Ramadan now, I'm asking myself, how do we really intentionally walk into this space and what am I really seeking right now? Um, and so I go back to the text and in the, in the text, just a few verses before it says that we have prescribed on you fasting like we have prescribed on those before you. Um, and it's, it's a 30 day fast where you're fasting from sunup to sundown. What does it mean to actually go on this journey that is both hard and rewarding all in the same space? Um, but it, right before that, it, there's this verse that it says, goodness isn't about turning your face from right to left or what direction you face. The highest levels of goodness are actually 
really giving yourself up into the divine, being mindful of the divine. And then it mentions one by one that you should be giving of what you share, cherish, your, your money, your possessions, and you should be giving it to your relatives, to the orphans, to the needy, to the travelers, to the beggars, to those who need to be liberated from bondage and to dive deeper into prayer. So I think of where we're living right now and as we're preparing for this moment, um, and I, I see myself uh, like being terrified walking into a grocery store because I go from one to the next and their shelves are empty. Mm-hmm. And this anxiety like really grips me and it's, it's, it's got these heavy roots that are hard to rip out. And yet when I listen to this text and, um, and, and actually pay attention and, and say, okay, like, where am I going to give? Um, it, it has this liberation that comes with it. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea what that means for me, like I, I, I sat with my anxiety, I was doing all this gratitude work, I was doing all this breathing and none of it was working. Um, but then a, a neighbor posted a message and said, um, I'm, I'm hu- like my, I lost my job and my child is, is home with me and I can't get another one right now. Um, and she, all she wanted was food. And so I found myself packing groceries from our cabinet, which I had, you know, went around and tried to find food. And I've got six big bags of groceries and my husband took them to her house. Um, and we still have food in our pantry and our bells are still, bellies are still full. And, um, that anxiety that was, is, is still living inside of me little relaxed its grip on me through those the the meaningful texts that actually said you should be giving giving to those around you and not and 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 trusting and submitting to something greater so that's really my intention that i'm trying to lean further into as i prepare for ramadan i've always found that to be such an interesting part of the religious experience is that there are things that seem contradictory or that seem um, to be, uh, things that you wouldn't exactly expect to happen. So the idea that, um, that you find abundance in scarcity, like you can look at the grocery stores and feel scarcity, that you feel that there is an absence of the things that you, that make sense to you or the way that you understand something. And then through a religious call, right? Through the call to give or through the call to fast, you unlock a sense of abundance which I think is just a remark, like it's a remarkably counterintuitive contradiction that religion enables um, in a way that is really countercultural, right? It's not something that our, our society says you buy your way into meaning, right? You shop your way into identity. Um, and here is a, is a holiday, an experience that says actually it's through the experience of, of scarcity, of there being, uh, of depriving yourself that you find those things that are enriching. Noah. Yeah, that really resonates with me for for this holiday for Passover because the matzah, which is that large wafer cracker that we eat, there it is both the bread of affliction and the bread of poverty and also the bread of freedom. There are only three ingredients in every matzah, flour, water, and heat. There's nothing else. There's no yeast. There's no spices. Any, any of that stuff that's been added, if it gets added, is now not allowed to be used at the Seder for fulfilling the religious purposes. It is the very basic ingredients. It is the staff of life itself. And it represents in our most opulent moment when we're supposed to have our best china and our beautiful silver and our beautiful tablecloths and what's underneath that that beautiful matzah cover is nothing but the bread of poverty and affliction. It's right at the center of who we are. And that's, that is the amazing thing about religious life, spiritual life, is that it can take what feels so desperate, so separate, so different in terms of our understanding of the world and brings those things together in, in one thing, in, in something as simple as a, as a piece of matzah. And so I, I think a lot about, and I'm reflecting a lot about what Aziza was just saying and what Najuma was saying about this time, about reflecting on what is it that is core and what is it that's true, mm-hmm. even if the technology, the, the architecture of our social lives are changing, is mm-hmm. are these truths still true? 
is it true that this bread of affliction can still be the bread of freedom, even if my relatives aren't literally sitting around the table with me? Um, or given this global pressure that's causing all of this anxiety, is our sacred core truth still true? And I believe that they are. And I believe that, that Passover, Easter, Ramadan, are just those those architectures can be those spaces that the architecture of their spiritual lives that create can be filled in every generation in slightly different ways, but the the space still holds. And I, I was to your point, uh, Bree and Noah. Um, the word essential. I know that's you know a word that's the buzzword now. Like do you know only only essential workers and go out for essential things. And I've been leaning into that word even on a daily basis with me and my children and whatever little activities we have because I'm because one of the things that I've shared with our congregation um, through our, our live streams is is this redefining of what's essential right like there are a number of things we thought we needed to have until you actually don't have them available to you and then you realize oh it's actually not essential it's you know and and how and how we in the church, we've, we've attached so much to Christianity and so much to church and so much to what it, to what it means to worship until all of that is stripped away. And, and it really does come down to what I believe to be true about God and, per, and this worship, you know, and, it's, and all the things that we've attached to it, uh, while they have been meaningful for a time and they were beneficial or, you know, they weren't essential. Um, and that worship really is about this personal relationship with the Lord. It's interesting to me yeah. that um, I think something that people don't often really recognize related to religion is that it is a remarkably adaptive container for things like meaning and community and self-transcendence and and ritual. That it's it, we often think about it as being something in written in stone tablets, right? And and handed down, but not necessarily grappling with the the remarkably flexible nature that religion provides for people because ultimately if it didn't adapt to the times that it was in, even while it was carrying forward a legacy of what came before it, it wouldn't survive. So as much as this is a test of how religion and religious people and religious institutions are um, you know, finding what is essential or what is uh, uniquely meaningful in this time, it's also an opportunity for religion to show what it does really well, which is to be adaptive and to keep people moving through this chain of memory and experience um, you know, anchored in the past, but, but not on... Um, not unfocused on the present and the future. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I feel like the, I mean, I've heard this so many times, but like that, um, like, you know, the, the Quran is like a time it is, is for all times. And it's actually our reading of texts of these different traditions um, that helps bring them to life in our own lives. And it's actually when we're in this state of taking things for granted and like, and all this abundance that um, we start to lose sight of what's really at the core and like what's really at the core of inspiration for us. And so when I'm, when I think about um, being able to, to really, to really look at the essence of the truth that's, that I'm holding on to that's so dear. It's like, it's stripping away all of these layers that are not necessarily um, essential to, to those things that are so true. And so like, I know when I heard you speak, like I was, you made me think of, uh, so in the Quran, it talks about how, you know, we're going to be tested about for with fear and hunger and loss of property and lives and crops. Um, and that it's it's actually those who say like we belong to god and to god we shall return that will find mercy and that will find a release into that kind of being able to free themselves into that space um and so i i hold on to to that and somehow you know being able to just kind of let myself go into it in free fall um, it has this incredible ability to, 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 yeah, release its grasp on me. It's really beautiful. I was thinking also about, um, 
like the technology that we're using right now, like the, you know, Zoom or whatever, it, it's interesting. The barrier to engagement with religious tradition has never been lower. And at least in my community, what I'm noticing is the desire, at least in my, my time in the rabbit, has never been higher. And that's a really interesting response that um, there are people who, we, we run daily services twice a day, early in the morning and, and then in the evening. And the response, people who are showing up or clicking themselves as being present in this space are people I never see. <laughs> people who are part of my community who I never see. And then beyond that, people all over the world who just, at the, it's almost like we have created in our respective um, you know, communities, um, if you take it as an aggregate, right? We have created religion on demand for any user out there. At any time, if you need a moment of grace, you can go onto social media and at some point in your social feed, you'll find a sermon, a vignette, a service, uh, a healing circle of some sort. It's all there. And I just find that really fascinating and really interesting uh, as to what the new iteration will be of, of all of us in the next uh, year or two when this plague passes and we return to the physical space. Will our folks, the folks who are seeking, be able to access us in the way that they can access us now? And of course, I don't have the answer, but I just find that utterly fascinating to me that there's almost like a prayerful Netflix happening or, or something where you can just anytime the, the moment that you need it, there's a live stream of something happening in the world that you can have access to. All you have to do is touch it, you know? That, that was a, one of the conversations we were having with some pastors is the number of ministers who are now doing not just Sunday, like a Sunday broadcast, but like a prayer group or a Bible study. And it's, it's, any given time on Facebook, like there's always somebody, you know, a pa minister so and so, pastor so and so, bishop such and such, first lady this. I mean, it's like they're just it's a constant availability, and but it's also to your point, Noah. Like when we had our our virtual Bible study, there were ten people who've never been to Bible study, <laughs> and I was like, wow. And they were like, well, I've you know, and for whatever reason, they haven't made it, but. Um, you know, it was just interesting that, you know, that on demand and how the accessibility, um, and maybe, maybe, in, and one of the things that I thought about is maybe in creating our buildings, we created walls and barriers when we thought we were creating access, you know, um, even though we were creating a building for this, for, for the sake of containment, but maybe we were creating more barriers than anything. So I don't, you know, I don't have the answer to that either. I just, it was just a thought like, wow, to see people so, um, and then people I don't know, like just kind of show up and, or follow and they send you messages. Um, and people are very drawn to needing and wanting more. Mm -hmm. And the accessibility is really interesting. Yeah. I'm wondering what you're each getting out of it. Right, because it's it's clear that there is a demand, and it might come from lots of different places. It might come from a reduced barrier. It might come from greater access. It might be filling a need where people are feeling adrift, and they're looking for ways to kind of signal to them about how you make sense of a very um, not just uncertain but uh, disorienting world. Um, and at the same time, religious leaders are deciding to engage in this activity, right? They're making themselves more available. So what is it giving you? Because um, we often think about what religious leaders offer, but not what, um, what the offering does for you. And it may be a, may be a double-edged sword. It may not just be something that you're offering. It may be taxing, but I'm really curious to understand the, its impact on you. You know, I love what you said about the taxing and the double-edged sword, because that's exactly where I am. Like there's both the blessing of individuals that I begged before to get on a Zoom call or to get on a video call who refused. Well, now I see all the time. Um, and so it's both the like blessing and the curse of being able to see them all the time. And I, I love it. Um, and it's overwhelming because now I've got everybody on my computer all day long. Um, and so the breaks uh, are harder 
it's and they they really have to come more intentionally sometimes my kids like yank my attention back into like the present um and that's a blessing in and of itself um and it really makes me think like i get overwhelmed by the sheer volume that's coming into my into my home from the outside world um and I love it and I seek it. And like you were saying, like the, with the Facebook live, like I can tune in and that's what I did the first part of the weekend. I just tuned in to all sorts of places all over the place and it was amazing. And then I just was exhausted. Um, and so in that exhaustion, it really made me step back and think, what is it that I really need and want right now? And for me, it's coming back to, um, so Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, like before he's received divine revelation, he spent lots of time in solitude, just meditating and contemplating and alone. And like a lot of Islam is actually informed by that, this idea of submitting and being on your own and meditating. And then the community part is so important. And I feel like right now I'm living in that tension between this beautiful overwhelm of community and needing to nurture the self um, and spend time in contemplation and really carving out that space. And that's actually where I'm finding more of my grounding um, because I'm, I'm loving the connection and I'm needing to make sure that um, I'm spending that time in solitude to, to nurture the inner self um, and to, to kind of ride through this moment. Um, I think for me, I think it's, um, um, I'm gonna use the word confirmation, like this, you know, like that's what I'm getting out of it. It's more confirmation of just, of, um, just continue to do the work and continue to minister. I, I, I enjoy preaching. And so being able to share in this way and that this volume is actually enjoyable for me. Um, I haven't, I haven't felt burnout, I, but I'm, I'm, so I'm pacing myself so I don't get burnt out. Um, but it's just, it's, for me, it's just been confirmation and um, it's been enjoyable. It's, you know, it's been enjoyable. I think what is, tech, what is different for me though is, to your point Aziza, um, the amount of information coming, like having to funnel the people calling, people are calling more, uh, more emails, more text messages. Um, <laughs> and so, and so, and I'm not, I'm a true introvert. I do well. I'm a true introvert. So too much coming at me in a day. I'll, I'll put my phone down for hours at a time just cause I can't have like too much coming at me. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, but I, but it, but the other side is the confirmation of the call to preach and to, and to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. For me living in the flow of feeling like I'm on, like living on mission on purpose has been incredibly gratifying. Um, but I am, I am worried about the pace. You know, like when you, when you're on a, a flight, the first five to 10 minutes, the engines rev up and you're not allowed to get out of your seat and you're all sort of locked in. You can't even like watch a movie yet, you know, cause it's, you know, you're not allowed to use your electronic device or whatever. And then you hit cruising altitude and everything kind of relaxes a little bit, but you're still propelled forward. I'm, I'm worried that we're still going up and I'm wondering when we're going to level off. And, um, and that, that's my, my actual biggest worry is about, about when I talk with all my employees and, and fellow clergy folk over at, at Valley Best Shalom is about how you're pacing yourself. Um, you know, like how, how are you going to pace yourself if this is a 24 month project? And, and I don't just mean being home and being isolated, but what I'm really talking about is the um, ever existent trauma that's going to pour out over this community globally, even after the historic event ends, because, um, because that's how this works. The, the historic event is still unfolding. Um, so everyone feels really tight knit in that space. Like it's still an ever unfolding happening, but when that happening is over and there are still people out of work and un unemployment's 30% and the banks are closing and, and then that all settles in, that's where we're hitting like supposedly cruise altitude, but we really need to be ramping up even more at that point. So I'm, I'm not, I don't have the answer brief. I, I am, I feel really gratified by the work I'm doing. I feel like I'm living on my calling and on my mission, 
and fulfilling my obligations, but I'm worried about what's going to happen three, six, eight, ten months from now when this crisis is just getting underway. Mm -hmm. It seems like one of the things that religions offer people are those guideposts and those rhythms to set the pace of a day, or we're talking about these holidays coming up in the in spring and April, and they set the pace of a year, or they, they, ca they create a sort of cadence to life that makes us understand where we are in the calendar. And this experience for many is profoundly disorienting. That's, and that's what I've noticed about myself is that I've grabbed onto small rituals of uh, just of really kind of basic things in life. I, I can tell you about the day by the coffee I make in the morning and the ice water I get at 11 and the Coke Zero I, I drink at 12.30 and the tea I take in the afternoon. And not because those things are actually really important, but because they give me a way to kind of pace and understand my day. And for a lot of people, religion does that, right? Religion step, starts off with a morning prayer or with a morning devotional. And yet there are a lot of folks who that's not something that they practiced or learned, right? So there, there is a need for the finding guideposts that help us make sense of our days. There might even be some practices that they are, you know, sort of peripherally um, aware of or have experienced but maybe that feel uncomfortable or don't feel natural or feel forced. So what kind of guidance can you give to folks who are feeling the sense of disorientation, who are looking for ways to make their days have a pace and a rhythm that feels like some form of normalcy that feels good so that they don't experience a, a compounded form of trauma, which is not just the environment that they're in, but the complete loss of agency over how their day looks or the sense of normalcy that they have in the days that they experience. Are there things that you're thinking about or guiding people towards as they grapple with this disorientation? Yeah, um, again, we've been doing this Lenten devotional and one of the things that we added as we've been going through this process or through this journey is um, a morning meditation and um, and, and I, I've been sharing with them about mastering your morning, like, you know, and taking from scripture about David who prayed early in the morning um, and how Jesus was, was found often praying in the morning and just really like doing what you can to kind of get pace in the morning to set the tone for your day. And with that meditation, using that throughout the day to ground you, to help you refocus, get recentered. Um, and so, because that speaks to both the spiritual, but also the human, because meditation is good for the body, it's good for the mind. Um, and so really offering a meditation for the day, but, but giving it in the morning, so they have it for the day to kind of pace themselves and to, and to have something that if the day gets off, if the day gets unsettling, you have the meditation to kind of, to kind of go back, lean back into um, for the day. And so that's one of the tools that we've been, we I've been pushing with our church and community is, is morning meditation that carries you throughout the day. What does it look hey, like? Um, some, sorry, I was wondering what it looks like for somebody to go back to the meditation when they're feeling blown off course by an afternoon. So I can imagine the morning meditation itself, but what's, What's the kind of anchor? What do you advise people? How do you, how does somebody do that when they're blown off course? Right. It's so, I mean, if whether you're in your car, well, you me in your car, but if you're in your car or if you're outside or in the living room, it's really just going back to it and just remembering, um, like today's meditation was, um, today's meditation was, um, God grant me the wisdom for this season. And so the encouragement was like, if you have, if your day gets off and you're, you have to make decisions, maybe hard decisions is to go back to that question, go back to that space of asking God to grant you um, wisdom for this season. Maybe it's wisdom for the hour or wisdom for the decision. So just giving them and, and, you know, and again, offering whether you're in your car, in your home, your room with the kids, like just going, going back to that place and, and repeating that, but also thinking, you know, really thinking through it and sitting quietly with that, that thought 
um, for, for a few minutes or until you can get, get recentered. And the challenge is um, because a lot of people aren't used to being so intentional every day because we, we have our, we, well, we're used to having our schedules. We're used to having our jobs to go to and our kids to pick up. And so we're used to having all these distractions and we don't have them anymore. So for some, it's, it's difficult. Um, so I think part of what's also happening in offering these new ways of, of, um, of guiding and recentering, it's, it's, it's a new normal for people. It's a definitely a new normal. Yeah. Yeah. Building there, um, specifically like the, so, you know, there's the five daily prayers in Islam. And for me, like the morning, kind of what you're speaking to Najima is the most deeply meaningful. Um, and before any prayer, you're supposed to take water and wash your hands and your face and your hair and your ears and your neck and your arms to your elbows and then your feet. And so, and like this, this ritual of like, you know, being able to recenter yourself um, throughout the day is a way to really kind of bring you back into the present. Um, but kind of to your point, Brie, is like, even like if you're, at, one, if you're into this prayer and you do the five prayers five times a day, like I also speak for myself, like sometimes I'm just going through the motions and they don't ground me in the way that I'm really needing. Um, and so what um, I've especially been focusing on is in the morning when I wake up for the prayer, um, I just sit up in the, sit up straight and start to breathe um, and then take in this, uh, there's this verse in the, in the Quran that's in a couple of different places, but it says that uh, God molded us and then created and then breathed of God's own spirit into each person. And so every single person has the breath of God inside of them and the soul. And so we have divinity inside of each and every single one of us. And so I'll just focus on my breath. And like, it's kind of like the waves of the ocean, like as it kind of, like, as it exits my lungs and, in, and comes in. And so um, in that morning when everything is still and being able to really focus on that and that the, the divinity that is always with me and always with every single one of us, wherever we go, um, that, that tends to be my anchor throughout the day is that like, as I'm before any prayer, before any moment, especially when I'm getting some bad news, whatever it is, um, really focusing on the sound of that breath leaving and entering my lungs um, as a way to, to bring me back to center, um, to, to really be able to, to be more present in whatever the, day, what, you know, the five daily prayers beyond them, but especially in those moments where I need that extra center. Yeah, for me, um, there's a bunch of things I want to say, of course. Um, the word intention in Hebrew is kavana. And um, it shares a, a root word with another Hebrew word called kivun. And the word kivun actually means direction. So um, one of the things that I always think about in, in this new world that we're living in is that everything that we took for granted, everything that kind of was the incidental contact with another human being we have to do intentionally now and um bringing that level of intention into this space is what is what gives us direction and um, gives us a path forward um i also want to say that i want to give anyone out there who is watching or listening the permission not to do anything um i, I feel like for some folks their experience of this trauma is that everything that's being put on them feels like just one more thing and they can't handle it or they don't want to handle it. So I really want to give permission that if any of this feels like an obligation that's heavy, then just um, just don't do it. Like just take the minute to do what you what you need to do for yourself. And that everything in this moment feels like an invitation and shouldn't feel like an obligation. And um, so for me, when I go through my morning prayer rituals or my evening prayer rituals, when I tuck my kids in and we pray at night before they go to sleep, when I take a walk in the middle of the day and return to my breath, those are invitations to engagement. I just, I don't, I don't want to see them as obligations to engagement. But I will say um, one last thing, which is um, I learned this from reading the book by Scott Kelly, who was the astronaut who was lived in space for, for almost a year. 
and they asked him how he how he made it through living in a tin can 200 miles above the earth um in his sense his own self-isolation and and it really came down to creating a routine that was nothing special just a routine and he took up a hobby when he exercised and that routine helped help him on every every one of his uh, revolutions around the around the planet over and over and over again for almost a year that 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 is what kept him focused and so I, I think again as an invitation is to think about what are those retreat routines that lead you into this larger narrative about who we are as people and and where we're going and, and if that feels too heavy then just think about today and if today feels too heavy then maybe just think about your coffee or your tea right now and if that feels too heavy just just try to breathe well thank you i think i'm going to breathe um just that much lighter or deeper i'm not exactly sure which one um maybe both uh at various points today because of um all that you share and teach i just have a profound sense of appreciation for you um all in each now um and in all our previous interactions so i hope that the thing that feeds me in all of this is um these relationships and they're hard for me on zoom they don't feel um as deep or as enriching or as um uh even as silly right i kind of that's the thing that i miss and so i love um the opportunity for us to experience the not the efficiency of zoom but the humanness so Najum, i love seeing your kids um i love seeing noah in a cowl neck sweater i you know aziza i always love seeing your smile and those things are the things that actually really make me feel nourished is just to get to experience us not as efficient and business oriented but as really human together so thanks for the opportunity to do that this morning Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is good. Wishing everyone a good holiday, too. Yeah. And we're off. <laughs> and look who's already joined us. <laughs> That's perfect. What better way to start? She's all mm -hmm. um, it's a blessing. Yeah, I, I think anytime you hit record on Zoom, it like signals to a kid that they must appear on screen. <laughs> like telepathic, I love yep. it. It's, it's, it's perfect, they're all locked into the signal. <laughs>